The head of Lugansk region, Sergei Gaidai, announced today that Russia wants to liberate Luhansk and even possibly end the war by June 22nd. Why this date was selected? What is the probability of Russia achieving this goal? And if this happens, does this mean that the war will be over in the nearest future? And these are the questions that we'll be talking about in today's video. What's up investors, Michael Spant and people of Reddit, it's the Russian dude and this is your daily update on Russian-Ukrainian war as of Friday, June 10th. You can see the main events of the day to my right, along with the timestamps. Happy Friday, everyone. Alright friends, this is probably the most important statement of this day, which is the statement by the head of Lugansk region, Sergei Gaidai. And he said that according to his intelligence, Russians will do everything possible to capture the Lugansk region before June 22nd, which is supposed to happen in less than two weeks from now. So the reason why this specific date was selected is pretty uncertain. But previously it was estimated that Russia had similar goal to capture the city of Severodonetsk before June 10th, which is basically today and as you can see it never happened. And I will not be surprised if these dates are selected by some higher Russian government officials just out of nowhere. Or I mean not out of nowhere, but to select something good and positive so they can deliver this good news to Vladimir Putin. But still, the main question remains the same, whether Russia will be able to achieve this goal before this date. And in my personal opinion, and I hope many of you can agree with me, the answer is no. And in order to prove my point, I will need to use the map of Ukraine and draw you the current situation in the east and south of the country. So first of all, we all already know that the main battle at this very moment is happening for the battle of city of Severodonetsk. Neither of the countries are advancing significantly any single day inside the city, but unfortunately the resistance of Ukrainians is getting very weak. The biggest battle inside the city of Severodonetsk right now is for the industrial zone, specifically the factory Azot. But besides that, Russian forces were able to achieve relative success in the city of Slavyansk. And the main goal of capturing this city is so they can open another front of attacking Severodonetsk. Another city of interest for Russian forces at this very moment is the city of Bakhmut. And so if Russians are able to capture these two key cities, this will give them significant advantage in the further invasion of Severodonetsk. At this very moment, roughly, the position of Ukrainian forces in this region is approximately like this. So as you can see, the only corridor which is left for them to get reinforcements or escape in the worst case scenario is the west of this region. And as you can see, if Russia is able to achieve its goals and capture both cities of Slavyansk and Bakhmut, this will shut down this corridor for Ukrainians. And eventually Slavyansk and Bakhmut will send reinforcements to the city of Severodonetsk, which will surround the remaining Ukrainian forces. And as a result, winning in the battle of Severodonetsk will potentially allow Russian forces to establish complete control over Luhansk region. Now the main question is, will Russia be able to do all this before June 22nd? And as you can see, even though this plan is very ambitious by Russian side, the probability of success in time is very slim. Ukrainian army is already demonstrating significant resistance and all all this is while they're still waiting for western weapons. Which brings me once again to the same question, why this specific date was selected. And if you remember, in the past the advisor to the president of Ukraine, Alexei Arestich, was saying that probably and hopefully Ukraine can get the majority of western weapons somewhere in the end of June. So most likely the reason why this date was selected by Russia is so that they can end this special military operation before Ukraine gets the weapons. Because I guess it's no longer a secret for anyone, as soon as Ukraine gets such significant reinforcements, the counteroffensive will be much easier. And also because of this, it doesn't make sense anymore for Russia to go anywhere else beyond this Luhansk region. So it is my honest expectation that in case Russia is successful in this part of Ukraine, hopefully the war, at least the main fighting part of it, will be over. Russia will proclaim some kind of victory to its citizens, they said they liberated Ukraine from Nazis and saved Ukrainians from Ukrainians. But in case the battle for Severodonetsk extends beyond June 22nd and Ukraine gets offensive weapons, most likely this will not happen. In this case, Ukrainians will be able to push Russians away from its territories and this will be a much better case scenario for Ukraine. And speaking really quick about the south, Ukraine was able to again launch several successful counteroffensive in Kherson region, as well as pushing the borders of the battlefront away for several kilometers in Zaporozhye region. 
region. So yes, the reason why Ukraine is so much better in the south of its own country, it is because Russia relocated the majority of its forces from the south to the east of the country. Welcome to another episode of Ridiculous Russian Propaganda. And today we have this article by German media, which is called Linke Zaituk, I guess, which says that Ukraine has lost approximately 200,000 soldiers. And yes, I know that this segment is called Ridiculous Russian Propaganda. And the reason I'm talking about German article, it is because it was Russian media who took this article and presented to Russian citizens. So I've never heard about this linky Zaituk, and I guess for a good reason, but Russian propaganda took this article and presented it as the official statement of the entire Germany. So what this article basically says is that Russian forces are crushing the resistance of Ukrainians, and at this very moment Ukraine is hiding its true numbers of losses. Which is once again as mentioned previously, according to them, is equals to more than 200,000 people. And the best part about this article is the justification how they came up with this number. Number. They basically said that according to their calculations, these 200,000 soldiers basically evaporated from the Ukrainian statistics. So it's like one day you had this number and another day this number was simply just gone. I have no even idea which statistics they are talking about, but that's what the article is about. And by the way, if you like this style of daily news reporting, feel free to like this video and subscribe to my channel. Also, please make sure to check the link in the description if you want to support Ukraine with us. You will get additional content such as daily Zoom calls with me and Q&A sessions and all the proceeds will be donated to Ukraine at the end of each month. Thanks so much and let's continue. Today the Minister of Defense of Ukraine, Alexei Reznikov, mentioned that unfortunately every single day, Ukraine loses anywhere from 100 to 500 soldiers. And the majority of these people are lost in the east of the country, which only confirms the fact of the importance of this battle for Severa Donetsk. He then also said that if Ukraine was to receive all these western weapons way sooner, all these human sacrifices could have been avoided. He then also proceeds by commenting on different strategies that are used by Russia and Ukraine. He said that Russia has much higher human potential, that is why they are not afraid to send as many people on this slaughter as possible. And at the same time, Ukraine tries to maximize efficiency as much as possible. This statement is then also confirmed by the military expert Alek Zhdanov, is that Ukrainian officers and generals have much higher military education. He basically says that the Russian way of doing war is basically the same as during the Second World War during Soviet times. Which is basically to send as many people as possible and try to win the war by numbers. And at the same time, Ukraine is trying to utilize more modern tactics, which were developed by NATO recently. And as you can see right now, tactics and morale have a significant resistance on just pure numbers tactics. Today, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Russia, Sergei Lavrov, as always, gave several ridiculous statements. So his first statement is that he has all the confirmation in the world that Poland is already actively invading Ukrainian territories. And what he means is that are not actually invading territories is just yet, it is just the government of Poland politically invading Ukrainian territories. So it's like they're looking for weaknesses where they will attack in the future. And the second statement he made was about these three mercenaries who are captured in Donetsk region who are sentenced to death penalties. He basically said that this Donetsk Republic is an independent republic and we should not care what they are doing because they know what they are doing themselves. So it's like Russia will never interfere with the internal politics of any other country. And at the same time this is some kind of protection in case this thing goes sideways in the future. Which is like if Donetsk Republic will be heavily criticized by Western countries for this action in the future, Russia will be like, oh no, we are not with them, we are separate. And speaking about these three mercenaries, the representative of the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Russia, Maria Zakharova, said that technically these people, they do not have the status of the prisoners of war. It is extremely hard to follow her logical chain which she uses to justify this action, but long story short, the reason why these people people deserve a death sentence, it is because technically they were not soldiers. Which if you think about this is even more ridiculous, so it's like you're basically sending civilians for death penalty. The former minister of internal affairs of Ukraine, Arsen Avakov, says that unfortunately it looks like that the next winter will be one of the 
toughest winters for Ukrainians. Because right now the infrastructure of the entire country is heavily damaged and besides as the economical situation among regular civilians is also very poor. Not too many people are working, many factories are closed and some of them are even destroyed, which basically means getting utilities will be very hard. And besides that, many people lost their residences and homes. All this, as you can imagine, will be a very big problem for the entire country of Ukraine this winter. Which only confirms the fact that besides weapons and military vehicles, Ukraine also needs financial support. So, you probably already know that one of the things about this war is that Ukraine wants to join the European Union as a result. At the end of this June, there will be a vote whether to extend the candidacy status to Ukraine. And so far, it is a pretty positive outlook for Ukraine joining the Union. But yesterday, three countries said that they would not want to extend this candidacy status to Ukraine. And among these three countries, only two are known at this very moment, and these are Netherlands and Denmark. The reason why Denmark is hesitant about this situation it is because there is an instability in Ukraine and because the democracy, human rights and minorities' rights are not perfect yet. The country of Netherlands gives pretty much the same reasons and they are hoping that Ukraine will improve so that they can say yes. And in the worst case scenario, Germany offers a compromise. In this case, Ukraine will be a technically member of the European Union. And yes, just as a reminder, June 23rd, 24th will be only voting whether to extend this status to Ukraine, while in fact the actual application and joining process to the European Union can take up to 10 years. Today, the president of US, Joe Biden, announced the highest inflation of the country for the last 40 years, which is at this very moment is at 8.6%. He was obviously talking about that the prices almost for everything are going up and it is getting harder to get by for just regular Americans. But at the same time, he did not miss a chance to once again blame Putin for this rise in inflation. He basically said that the reason why the inflation is getting so high and it is unstoppable, it is because of this new Putin tax. And I mean, yes, it is always nice to have someone to blame for your mistakes. Thank you so much for your attention, check the link in the description, stay safe and see you on Monday.